High fly ball to deep right. Perkins back. Still back. Off the bricks. Perkins kicks it. And here comes Spann. He's going to do it. And it's one nothing Giants. Well, you want to get the crowd going? Try an inside the park home run. Why not? I, I think Spann could have run. Yeah, man, we are excited to have the man in the video a second time on the podcast. We welcome in an 11-year vet who had a career 281 batting average, 265 doubles, 72 triples, 71 home runs, 490 RBIs, nearly 200 stolen bases. This man wreaked havoc on, on the base path for pitchers. He always found ways to get on base. He made pitchers tear their hair out working the count. He hit triples up the line all with the calmest demeanor known to man. Ladies and gentlemen, get to know the man that I am so happy to welcome back on the podcast, my favorite player of all time. It is Denard Span. How's it going, man? Good, man. What, hey, man, what an what a opening statement and, and line. And, and you, made me, uh, you made me feel really good right there. Good job. Hey, man, I, I appreciate that, man. Uh, again, I, I know I said it before. I appreciate you coming back on the pod. Uh, it was funny. I was talking with my, my buddy before we came on here and he said, he was like, you know, you should put on like the inside the park home run he had with, uh, the giants. Yeah. And, uh, do you remember that home run pretty well? I'm assuming. Of course. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember that, uh, that day. Actually, I remember that at bat, I, you know, I was leading off the game and, uh, very seldom do I, I swing at the first pitch of the game. I usually like to take at least a Lisa pitch, sometimes take a strike. Um, but something, you know, went over me as I was walking up, the, up, up to the plate, uh, which happens, would happen at least four or five times a year when I swung at the first pitch. But I don't know, like I, when I dug, when I, you know, dug into the box, I, I, I said to myself, you know what, I think this feels like a good time to swing at the first pitch. Um, and that's what I did. And, you know, definitely caught uh, the Phillies off guard and, and, you know, obviously put a good swing on, on the ball. And as um, soon as that ball hit off the wall, I, I knew <laughs> Off to the races. I'm assuming you weren't tired because you had speed for days. I can't remember. I mean, <laughs> obviously in my uh, in my older years, but no, nah, I, I definitely could have. I could have kept going at least one more time around the bases. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm curious because we uh, kind of off topic a little bit, but kind of with that, uh, MLB the show came out this week, okay. and the looking up the inside the park home run kind of reminded me just of, of that. And I'm curious, did you ever know what your highest rating was in the game? I don't, I really don't recall. I really don't, man. I, I can say I played with myself a handful of times, so I, I don't. <laughs> do not they, I think they, they underrated you a little bit. Cause again, you do all the little things again, you weren't in center field. You had the best tracks to the ball. So you didn't need to die for things. They they gave you a uh, when I checked the highest I could find was a seventy nine and I felt oh, like that was very disrespectful. That's very disrespectful. They didn't even give you eighty. That's what I'm saying. It's ridiculous. Even with the like, I was I was trying to figure out what your best year overall was. I'd probably say one of those years you had with the Nationals where you had thirty one steals and you hit three hundred. Yeah. But they still and that year didn't give it to you either, which is crazy to me. Hey man, I, I got to be honest with you. I'm kind of um used to you know what i mean being a, like a under the radar type player um that's kind of just the story of my life the story of my career always an overachiever um i you know i really never got myself caught up in you know all of those types of um you know accolades or just different things like that where you know people give their opinion on me um mm -hmm. probably looking back if i saw that that probably put a chip on my shoulder you know, all the people that doubted me, though, though, they were the reason why I was able to, you know, do the things I was able to do. So um, it doesn't surprise me um, that, you know, I didn't, you know, get an 80 or a, uh, 80 or 90 or whatever the case may be. But, um, you know, that's like once again, that, that's that's the story of my life and and what motivated me to, um, you know, come in year in and year out and, and prove that. Um, I was a solid, uh, an above solid, solid, solid uh, major league baseball player. You really were uh, in every sense of the word. You, you did all the right things. You went to work, you know, working, like I said, I said in the intro, you know, working the count, uh, making pitchers work, you know, on the base pass, causing havoc in center field. You were the person you could put back there. You know, you were going to get to every ball. 
and you did it with what looked like such ease, even though I know it's very difficult. And uh, that's why I'm sure any teammate we, you know, that I'm sure we would talk to would all say just how good of a professional you are. And that's why you were my favorite player, because I felt like that under the radar, like no one talks about Denard Span and how hard he works and i just i could tell that all just just from watching and so it's it's really it's unfortunate for the show that they didn't recognize that but i know a lot of twins fans and nationals fans and everybody else definitely recognize that about your game yeah and I, and i would say like you like you just said all of my teammates you know um all of the the teams that i play for the organizations that i play for i think if you came and watched me play night in night out you would appreciate what i brought to the table you know mm -hmm. obviously flashy player um but i did a lot of you know good things um really well and um you know i just didn't get the the national notoriety if you will but um you know at the end of the day all that mattered for me was that my teammates respected me and, and um they knew that you know that they could count on me and, and that i was a professional and that every day um at seven o'clock i was prepared i did you know all mm -hmm. of the things that i needed to do um in order to to you know help the team win basically and, and you definitely did. Um, speaking of when, I know that's what a lot of teams are trying to do this upcoming season. Uh, as the baseball season's kicking off, which I can't think of a better way to kick off our podcast than having you on before the season starts. Uh, I'm curious, I, just, you know, obviously since we last talked, you've been doing a lot of things and reading up, you're now kind of working overtime. I mean, you're working as an analyst for both the Twins and the Rays for this upcoming year. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I mean... You know, I got got the opportunity to uh, go back to Minnesota last year for Joe Mauer's Hall of Fame. Um, yeah, they, they, yeah, it's Hall of Fame ceremony. Um, and, you know, I was able to run into a lot of old um, colleagues of mine. And, you know, we, we began having conversations. And um, before you know it, you know, the, there was a, an offer on the table for me to come back home and, and do some TV. And, um, and they were also gracious enough for me to, you know, stay home with the Rays and, and do some TV as well. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be covering both teams. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to, um, you know, I'm actually being the booth this year. Um, last year, I, you know, I just did pre and post game with the Rays. And, and this year I'll be in the booth with Minnesota um, as an analyst and, and calling, calling the entire game can't wait for that i actually watched back our interview from a couple of years ago and i actually brought that question up to you i said would you ever consider being like a color commentator at the time it was for the nationals yeah. and you said you were like not right now i'm happy with the role i'm in you know you were doing great stuff with the rays working with player development and uh man I i'm just so happy for you that you because you're you know baseball so well and i like i'm sure it's gonna be a treat for everybody to hear you talk about the game uh is there an aspect of it that you're looking forward to the most yeah, honestly, just just coming out there and, and you know, just giving a, a, obviously a different perspective, you know, a different personality, a different swagger, you know, a different flair. Um, but then, you know, just giving fans an opportunity to, you know, um, just get to know me more, um, get in my mind, get in my brain, you know, and just just listen to me talk about the game and how I um, process the game as a center fielder. Um, it's going to be different than, you know, a, a catcher or infielder. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the other guys that that um, that are on the, the the roster as far as you know covering the twins. So um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to just teaching and, and just having a um, a good time, you know, on on the on the telecast. Denard, have you thought about a catchphrase you're gonna have? I have not thought about that, man. I really have not. That, that, you know what? You just brought up a a good a good point. I, I need to do that, but no, I, I haven't. I haven't. What, what do you think? Turn in. I'm going to turn in some random Twins games in July. I'm going to expect <laughs> to hear something, okay? Well, like a home run call or something like that? Or what? Yeah, like a home run call or like a diving catch or like, you know, somebody's caught stealing. Like, I want to hear an original phrase. You're that, putting a lot I'm of pressure like, on that call, that Eric. That, that might just be a spur of the moment thing that just comes naturally. I don't know if I want to like, you know, premeditate that. I think I just might want to go into it and just let it flow and just let it – um, just freestyle it, if you will. I think you're going to come up with something good. I got a gut feeling about it. Yeah. Do you think you'll get more animated What's seeing that? someone hit a home run? Do you think you'll get more animated hit, seeing someone hit a home run or seeing someone make like a diving catch in center field? I mean, by nature, that's who I am, especially when I get to play. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, 
my first reaction to, you know, make a noise or, you know, uh, make a, like you said, an animated, um, you know, type, type squeal, if you will. Um, so I more, I, like I said, I'm gonna try to be myself, you know, I, until somebody tells me I need to tone it down, I'm mm -hmm. just gonna be myself as much as possible. I think it's kind of interesting. So since we last talked, Denard, there's been a lot of changes in baseball. Uh, there's a pitch clock now. There's bigger bases uh, to make it easier for stolen bases. You only get two pickoff attempts as a pitcher. I'm curious your thoughts on the new rules that were put in place to increase pace of play. And do you think how many more stolen bases you could have gotten with these rules? I still may, may, be, may be playing if, if these <laughs> act before I retire. Um, I mean, obviously the game is, is trying to, you know, bring more action and, you know, get guys to, to steal bases. And, um, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of ironic that, you know, what, a few years ago, everybody was trying to go away with the stolen base and the triples, everybody just wanted to see home runs. And, um, we obviously saw that, you know, that was not good for the game. You know, guys are they're hitting a home run or striking out way, it was way too many strikeouts. And, um, so it's good to see that, you know, they, you know, ban the, the shift and have, you know, kind of incentivize hitters to be hitters, right? Have a two strike approach. And I, I can tell you as a, as a former player, it was tough to watch the game the last, you know, three to five years because guys were with two strikes going up there as if they were in offensive counts and, you know, taking big hacks and, and not, you know, not just not playing the game the right way. And so, um, I think, you know, Major League Baseball, I thought I thought last year they did a really good job with, you know, with those um, changes. And um, it just seemed like it was more enjoyable to watch. And there was action. Um, and then the pace of play. At first, I wasn't a fan of it. Um, but, you know, you know, watching a clean game and it was, you know, it had a, a really good pace. It, um, I got used to it really quickly, especially, you know, covering the game. I wasn't at the ballpark all day. So it, it definitely um you know just just made it uh, a lot more just, just a lot more um, interesting and fun to watch do you think that the pace of play could or has led to the increase of injuries especially with pitchers uh you know obviously having to ramp up your delivery that much quicker is that something you feel like correlates or is that something you thought was more kind of coincidence from last season you know what i me not being a pitcher it's hard for me to speak on that yeah you know, I, it, it makes sense in theory, you know, if guys are having to rush their deliveries and, you know, having to, you know, like if there's one or two seconds on the clock, they have to um, speed up their arm or speed up their motion and they don't get an opportunity maybe to use their lower half the way that they normally would. And um, so I, I think we just have to um, pay close attention to what happens, you know, this year and next year and, and, and see if the injuries, you know, continue to pile up, hopefully not. But if that's the case, then, yeah, they might might have to consider altering that yeah it's it's definitely something like you said i think has overall made the game better and even with the potential right now with pitchers and, and them complaining about the injuries i think they're going to want more of a sample size before they would consider changing anything back but like you said i think everything has been good for baseball just in general with that um i'm curious with again we talked about the uh the bases we talked about pickoff attempts and the pitch clock one of the things that hasn't changed yet but i'm curious if your thoughts that could change or would you like to see changed is the amount of games played because anthony rendon came out this off season talking about wanting a shorter season around like 100 games i saw anthony rizzo and trevor may also make comments about that do you think that would be something beneficial for players today or something that you would prefer, or do you like the full grind of 162? Oh man, that's, a, that's such a tough question. I mean, in theory, I'm like, yeah, does it take 162 games to figure out who's the best team? Um, but on the other side, it's like, this is, that's just the tradition of baseball. It's always been that it's always been, you know, an everyday type of sport. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I'm kind of torn. I'm kind of torn in between the two. I could, I could, I could rock with Rendon and Rizzo and May on like, yeah, man, let's just play, you know, five days a week instead of seven days a week, and you know, that's still a lot of baseball. Mm -hmm. um, but flip side, I look at all of the records and just the history of the game. Um, you know, now you, you know, now you're gonna have to alter how guys get in the Hall of Fame and you know what, you know, what are the what are the benchmark um, type of stats and stuff like that. So it, it just would. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just it would alter just 
the history and a lot of, of what baseball has been for, for um, this long. Denard, we've, you know, talked about a lot of the changes that have happened within baseball, the sport, but also kind of the media landscape as well, because when you were playing, social media wasn't as prevalent as compared to now. And, you know, you've been in different roles with organizations as hitters. Now you're an analyst, you know, you've worked closely with player development. Um, I know it's impossible to manage what people post, but are there more guidelines, more protocols? Like, have you seen the change in how teams approach this? Um, I mean, that's I, honest. I don't know if I have an answer for you on that, but I, I do know that the game obviously has changed. We're in a different, like you said, generation. It's a different landscape of social media. You know, I come from the generation where it was like, you know, you, you just part of the reason why I was such a humble guy was because that's the that's the way we were brought up as a as young ball players, and that kind of just you know materialized into that's who I was, and you kind of just you know play the game in in between the lines, and then you know off the field you know you you just you know you take care of business and do what you're supposed to do um and stay out of trouble and and don't you know bring any attention to yourself and um now we see you know the, this generation you know guys you know with social media and the way they market themselves um they're you know it's, it's just so so much opportunity you know off the field that they're taking advantage of and um i would say even you know where it used to be shunned you know, now it's like, you know, the game um, is, is welcoming these young players and they see the value in it. It brings more eyeballs and, and more attention to the game. So um, as long as, you know, as long as as long as the guys are responsible and you're not, you know, posting um, silly stuff, um, I, 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 I from, from what my knowledge is, you know, the, the league and the teams welcome it. There's um tying into that. There's one more serious question I want to ask, because I like I like to ask you like more fun and uh kind of that type of question. So talking about the, the younger players, uh, one uh, again, uh, one of my buddies is coaching high school baseball. He's coached for 12 years. I'm coaching high school softball this year. And one of the things he's felt like has really changed is kids opting out of high school baseball because of travel teams. Mm. And he said, basically, they have, they're not getting recruited at the high school level. So they're basically only getting watched when they do their travel team. So the fact that they're staying on their travel teams year round is hurting the high school sports. Um, I, I can already know in, in our conference, uh, one of the top players is not playing this year. Um, do you think that this is something that is a problem? Do you, do you feel that high school sports should be more prevalent or, or do you think going the, whatever route you get to seen more should be okay? I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's my first time hearing that because I know down in Florida, like, you know, only, the only way you don't play high school baseball is if you aren't eligible to play high school baseball mm -hmm. grades. And, you know, you want to you have to go the, the showcase, uh, that, you know, the showcase or travel ball route. Um, I mean, I I feel like player uh, players should play both. I, like High school should be a priority, in my opinion. You know, that's that's just the way it's always been. I mean. Now, if you want to play travel ball and get yourself a little bit more exposure, then you go and do that. Um, but at the end of the day, like the cream is going to rise to the top. Like, you know, whether you get seen now or later, like I got to imagine that if you have talent, somebody's going to see it and somebody's going to report it no matter where you are. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I it's just it's very frustrating around here. Our uh, our entire baseball program has 20 kids that yep. includes JV varsity and freshmen. Um, yeah. it, it's just unfortunate, but like you said, I think hopefully high school can stay a priority no matter where you are and you can kind of marry both of them. Uh, yeah. Like you said, that that's, that's surprising to me because you know, obviously I know, you know, how popular, um, travel ball is, but I, I felt, I, I, I always thought that once you got to high school during the spring, you focused at your high school or, you know, whatever school you're at, and then during the off season, that's when you, you know, play your travel ball to get more reps, get better, get stronger, whatever the case is, and go, you know, and play in front of scouts and, and all, you know, other um, great talent. But this is, I didn't, this is the first time I've ever heard, you know, guys are skipping or people are skipping, you know, their high school team to go play for a travel ball. Yeah, that, 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 don't, that sounds a little odd. Hopefully it's not something that's going to continue. It's just a weird trend that's going right now. At least we're in the Northeast right now in New Jersey where I'm at. Um, but I am curious, obviously 
getting off kind of more of the serious stuff, man, I'm, I'm going into this season right now. You obviously are going to call games for my squad, the Twins. You're also calling games for the Rays, as we mentioned. Uh, what are your thoughts on these two teams this year, man? The Twins winning their first playoff series in 20 years. The Rays are always contending and have this young talent. What are your takes on these two teams this year? Um, I think they're both two teams that have a lot of similarities. Um, you know, they they do a good job at, you know, acquiring players and, and also developing players in their minor leagues. Um, both of them, I think, to the core, or obviously the Rays are a small market team. The Twins, you know, to the core are a small market team. They've kind of developed into a, a you know, a mid-tier um, spending type club. Um, but they still do small market types of things, like like I said, with trades and developing the players. Um, but when I look at you know the Minnesota Twins, um, you know they they have a really good ball club, man. They they you know starts off with their pitching, um, you know their, their starting pitcher. Even though they lost you know uh, a couple guys you know to free agency, um, they still are strong with you know Pablo Lopez leading the way. Um, and then you look on you know the the position player um, side, their their infield is is, is freaking ridiculous. Um, you got Royce Lewis at third, um, healthy for the first time in his career, entering a season. Um, I, I, I have big hopes for him. I think if he can stay healthy all year long, you know, you might see um, a guy who, you know, puts a lot of people on notice and has an all-star type of season. Um, Carlos Correa, I'm, I'm excited for him year two, um, you know, fresh off of, you know, what happened the offseason before. Um, I, it was kind of to me. I don't think a lot of people were talking about you know what he had to go through during the off season before you know losing two three hundred million dollar deals and then you know having to if you will settle for you know a two hundred million dollar contract. But that's still a lot for a guy to go through emotionally. Um, so you know I, I think last year he was kind of you know just kind of had a hangover from that situation. So I think he's a year removed from that. So I think he'll get back to you know what he's capable of doing. Um, I'm just going around the infield. Edward Julian, um, young, I think he'll uh, continue to get better. You know, obviously the league's probably going to adjust to him, um, but everything that I've heard and seen from him, he's a grinder, and I think he'll, you know, be able to, you know, handle himself really well. Um, I like the addition to Carlos Santana. Um, you got a guy who is a switch hitter. You can plug him right in the middle of the lineup. Um, he's, you know, pretty much an equalizer. He can face lefties or righties. Um, and he's going to give you a good at bat. You know, he, he uh, doesn't expand the strike zone and uh, provides power and stability in the middle of that lineup. Um, and then, of course, um, the big man in center field um, coming back healthy. He's another key piece to this this team. Um, this is a different ball club when um, when he's out there in center field versus DH. And, um, he brings so much value um, with his glove and with his defense and with his legs. Um, so if he can stay healthy, um, I I could see this team, you know, going deep into the playoffs. And um, I'm trying to think who's in uh, left field is, uh, dang. Uh, Do they have, I think Matt Walner's starting, right? You're right, yeah. He he had a breakout season last year. Um, has been a little slow this spring training, but I wouldn't worry about that. Um, yeah, wait, till the, wait till the lights come on, then I'll, I'll judge you. Spring training, obviously, for some guys it's important, but, you know, he showed what he can do last year. Um, and then Max Kepler, uh, he had a season, a bounce back year last year as well. So uh, when you look at the team, like it's it's a complete team. And then, I, you know, the bullpen, obviously Duran just went down with an oblique. Hopefully that it doesn't last long. But, um, you know, the, the bullpen is, is nasty as well. So I, they have a, a complete team if everybody can stay healthy, which obviously that's a big, that's a tall task. Um, um, so for them, like I, I like what I see from them. Um, Tampa Bay, you know, it's one of those, you know, they, we see that we say this every year. It's like, you know, they lose three or four of their best players and you're like, what are they going to do now? And, um, they always have a game plan. They always have you know, a formula, um, to, to, to put guys in, in, in the right position to be successful. Um, they plug and play, um, they, they platoon guys. And, and like, once again, they just put guys in the, in the right position. Um, you know, but obviously some new faces, Jose Caballero, um, taking over for Wanda Franco. Um, you know, we haven't really seen Caballero play a lot, but obviously if the Rays went and, and traded for him, they must have saw something. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to watching him play. Um, Josh Lowe, I'm looking forward to him, you know, building off of what he did last year as well. Uh, Randy and Rosarena, of course, he's, you know, probably the most exciting player in that ball club. Uh, Yandy Diaz, you know, he was unbelievable last year. Um, so, but the biggest question mark for me is going to be 
believe it or not, we haven't said this in a while, is their um, starting pitching. You know, they, they had some injuries and they lost some guys. Um, so um, obviously Zach Eflin is, is the horse. And then they got uh, Aaron Savale and then um, uh, Zach Littell. Um, the, uh, heading head, heading their their starting rotation. So um, and then their bullpen is solid as well. But um, primarily they're going to be based um, looking to win ball games with their pitching and their uh, their defense. And I know I was long winded, but I was, that was a good practice because I'm up. I've been I've been keeping up with both those teams. So I appreciate you asking me that. Let's go. That was, that yeah. was perfect, man. You should uh, play fantasy baseball. You know the ins I- and outs of every team. <laughs> <laughs> Would you do you ever play fantasy baseball or not? Is not your thing. I've I've just done flag. I'm not flag. I'm still fantasy football, but it was like <laughs> played the, yeah. Hey, maybe maybe one year we can convince you to play, and I'll, we'll just manage your team for you. That way, you don't have to. You can draft the guys, and then we'll take care of the other stuff for you or something. But I can, I can do that. It's just all keeping up with it day to day, and all of the you know the different you know injuries and transactions. That's where I would not win. You know, if I had somebody that you know like a teammate if you will an assistant gm that would help me yeah i, I would be i'd be all in on it Let's the go, irony man. that the irony that you're like i can grind through that 162 game season but following my team for 20 weeks nah i can't do it <laughs> i can't do that man i i have been there i already did it in my former life i'm, I'm yeah. doing hey maybe maybe next year we can do we can co-manage a team we you you can draft it and then I'll help you manage it so you don't have to worry about the day to day. It's but fun, you, man. It, it's fun. Yes, and you guys are in fantasy baseball. Oh I'm man, we love it. it. Oh yeah, it, it's all it's. We love fantasy baseball, real baseball. It's all, like everything. Okay. Do you guys do it like? Is it don't they have like a dynasty? Like you can kind of like do it continuously, or do you just do it like you a fresh new start every year? Fresh new so, start every year. So I was in a couple dynasty leagues, and they're fun. Um, but that's also where it's like, if you're not going to manage it all the time in the sense of like in the off season, people are trying to offer a bunch of trades and everything. And it gets pretty hectic in that sense. I always, I've been the kind of guy that likes hitting the reset button every year, giving myself a few months off and then go back into it. Um, you need oh. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the mental grind of the, the 20, the 20 <laughs> week season of that. Um, but man, I, like I said, man, if, if you ever feel like as long as you didn't have to manage it, but you want to draft it, like let's go, man. Let's uh let's draft the team. That, next that's year. why they have best ball. So you can literally just draft a team and then it plays the best lineup for you at the end of the year. So you never have to check your team. It will do that like every day, you mean? Play the play yeah. the yeah. Well, how about this? When the season is over this year, reach out to me, make a note of that. And depending on where I'm at in my life with you know <laughs> craziness, I, I might I might take you up on that offer. Let's go. I love it. Uh, I would be remiss before we, we close out here, Denard. Uh, I play a lot of golf now. I know you play golf too. And uh, I, I got to ask, man, how's the golf game going? Not good, man. I got to be honest with you. I don't play, I don't play consistently enough. Um, it seems like every time I, I get it going and I feel like I, I, you know, I'm, I'm picking up some momentum, um, something happens, life happens, and then I won't play for like two months. And then it's like starting from scratch again. So, um, not good, man. It really isn't. Do you uh, do you find yourself like? Have you gotten in a groove to where you're like, I think I got it down, and then it just like. No, I got to. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just drop it. You have a lot going no, on. No, you can't, drop, drop, it. You can't drop, drop it. You can't drop it. That's to that point yet. No. I've been trying to get this one to to, uh, to come out with me, but he he's being stubborn, and he Eric won't come out uh, for a round. But I do like it because it's like, what other sport are you going out there? in the like you know having a couple drinks or whatever just you know riding the cart with your buddies hit a couple balls like it, it's it's a very relaxing sport i now i agree with you now like it, it, the times that i have played which is not a ton but the times that i have played and i've been out there like you said on that golf cart and you know just just shooting the if you will and just having a, a good time like you know it is it is a, a great outlet um, you know, just to get away from whatever you're going through, you know, in the regular life, if you, I'm not regular, like real life, you know, family, whatever, it's a good outlet. And, um, I've always, you know, just the, the, like I said, the few times I've gone, I've, I've enjoyed myself. I just, I don't know, man. I, you know, <laughs> life is about seasons and right now just golf isn't it. Yeah. Denard, I, I'm with you on that because the vibe is great. Like you're chill, you're out with the guys, you're, you know, hit, drinking a couple drinks, hitting some balls, very chill. There's no drama. But to do it on a consistent basis, that's just not where 
four hour that's like a four hour day so it's like <laughs> Yes. Last time I played 18 holes, man, like I was, I was, I was out for like four days. Like I was, <laughs> I was on my feet all. I, I see the last time I played 18, I actually walked the entire 18. So it was like my body was sore for about three, four days. My joints were killing me. Like you know, it, it, it's a, it's a lot for me, man. But you know, one of these days, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into it. I know, man. I'm, I'm going to wait for that day. I, I thought because I know when we reached out uh, before, you were like, I'm golfing that day, and I was like, my man. I, yeah. I really Taking left, and my see. So I, I, let's see. This is what I'm saying. It's always something. I was taking lessons. I was doing it consistently. Now all of a sudden, my golf instructor like like he quit. Like he quit. He quit the company that he was working at. And so I haven't gone back. I haven't taken the initiative to reach back. That's out. a sign. That's a sign. And so that, that's what I said. I was like, maybe just right now, not for me right now. So um, yeah, I don't know, man. Man, well, I'm hoping some point that will, you'll pick it back up, or if not, it's all good. I mean, I was like, maybe I'll talk some golf with Denard's fam, but it's all it's all good, man. Uh, I, I I do appreciate you coming on here. This is an absolute blast chatting it up with you. Um, the last question I want to ask before we get out of here, I did I realized I didn't ask you this question last time, so oh. I, I had to ask you, who was the toughest pitcher that you played against? Oh man, I feel like I get asked this. It's it's tough to just say one guy. Like so yeah. I think pitchers. Um I would say I can I just can I just like name off a couple that come come to my head or come to the front. I'm gonna take um, let me see if I can guess a few of them. I'm gonna I'm gonna assume Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander are definitely in there, and Jacob deGrom is probably in there. Justin Verlander, he's not. Really? Ooh. Justin Verlander, like he's he's a Hall of Famer, um, but if I only face no, I was gonna say if I face Justin Verlander in my career, I might have been a Hall of Famer too. Really? I have, I have to. I, what are I have to look at your numbers against him? You must have killed him. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I saw the ball really well off him. I saw the ball really well. So so not him, uh, Max Scherzer. You know, I didn't face him a lot, like later in his career, like when like. I faced him, I remember early in his career when he was with Detroit. Mm -hmm. Boy, he got really good. There's an article about this. You hit 413 off Justin Verlander. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, I'm trying to be humble here, but like. <laughs> I love it. Oh, wow. man, 413? I wonder if that's the highest batting average for a player against him. If you're looking that up. Oh man, dude! There's I, an article on CBS about it. That's oh, that's crazy, man. Four thirteen. Like you know, you as a hitter, like I don't know the numbers, but I know that when I face it, like you know, certain hitters know that certain pitchers they know when they when they when they're facing, they they do really well against them. So I I every time I face him, like I if if I didn't get a hit, like it was it was a solid a solid day. So man. I'm looking at the teams that you played on versus good pitchers. And I'm going to name off a couple. Uh, your twins time, maybe CC Sabathia. Later when you're with the Nationals, Jose Fernandez. Josh Johnson had a couple really good years. Uh, Sabathia, that, that was one of the guys I was that I was going to end up saying. And then I was going to say like a Roy Holiday. He was nasty. Mm -hmm. uh, what about Cliff Lee? I feel like Cliff Lee followed you from the AL Central to the NL East. You know what? Like early, like when when Cliff was with with Cleveland, I saw him really well. And then when he came, went over to the National League and went to the Phillies, and I was in Washington. Like he obviously kicked his career into another gear as well. And um, yeah, he yeah he he had my number then as well. But yeah, he was uh, yeah he was tough man. He he worked really fast and uh, you know commanded you know his fastball curveball really well and. Yeah, he was definitely, definitely difficult at bat. Man, well, Denard, I, I want to make sure I stay true to what we promised here. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This is it's always one of my favorite interviews to, to talk with you, and uh, can't thank you enough for your time. No problem, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll finish this up again, man. This ain't it. Let's go, run it back third time. I'll wait till, of course, after the season's over, and maybe we'll get that fantasy team going. Uh, all that good stuff. David, drop that trademark that he says in July in the next intro. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, man. Thinking about you guys, man. Y'all take it easy, man. I, I appreciate uh, 
Appreciate you just, uh, you know, just just treating me with with respect, like I said before, and, and treating me with so much love, man. I appreciate it. it means it means the world to me. Hey, man, Denard, I 